Kent University Library Art Gallery and to the second of our library lunchtime lectures for this semester. Our speaker today is Dr. Ali Pure from the Bill Kent Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. We we're actually slowly getting all members of that department to speak. They seem to be uh, quite popular with this series because genetics and related issues are obviously very important and very interesting. Uh, I'll say a few words about uh, Dr. Gure uh, before I let him uh, give his talk, but I shall keep my comments as short as possible. Uh, Ali Gure uh, received his uh, Doctor of Medicine MD degree from Anchor University in 1988, and then he flew over, I presume, to the US and pursued his PhD doctoral studies at Cornell. Um, he worked for a while at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research within the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, at New York, uh, and he joined Bill Kent in 2006, I think. Is that That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, his research interests include, I am told, cancer immunobiology, early diagnosis, and cancer epigenetics. Uh, he has published a vast amount of uh, research in many uh, important journals and has received over 2,500 citations. I wouldn't even like to think what my own history papers are in comparison to that, but a lot less. He also holds over 20 patents, patents uh, in relation to his research as well. Uh, our topic today, altruism in cancer research, curing the patient, but also saving the isolated scientist. We have the two perspectives on that. Uh, we are hoping to have some time for questions at the end. We normally finish the session at 1.30 because people have classes to go to. Uh, and so uh, Professor Dr. Gurea is happy to receive your questions. We'll finish a bit early. And I should remind you, in order not to disturb his talk, please switch your phones, etc., to silent mode or switch them off. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks for the uh, precise and inspired introduction. Hopefully, I'll continue with the same spirits. The, um, when I was invited, I was told that this ought to be a talk for non-biologists. But when I look in the audience, I see quite a number. So uh, excuse me if the talk is a bit too simple for biologists. But remember that I intended this to be for those who do not have a biology background. So the concept uh, that I'll try to explain to you is rather complex, but I tried to do my best in simplifying this so that all of you get the uh, picture clearly. The um, title reflects my understanding of science as I'm getting close to my 50s. When I was a student and uh, entered the graduate school uh, in the United States, the, um, I think it was the secretary of the Dean for Graduate Studies came over and said, so how do you feel being part of the scientific community now? And uh, I was upset because my classes were not going well and so forth, and I quite rudely said, I'm not aware of a scientific community yet. And she was sort of upset, obviously, with the answer. But now, at this age at, and time in my career, I'm very aware of a scientific community. And if it had not been there, I probably wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now. And the reason why this talk is titled Altruism in Cancer Research is because I'm doing cancer research, so I realize the altruistic aspect of science in cancer research. And as I'll explain to you to the best of my ability, um, because uh, altruism apparently does not uh, have a you know, direct Turkish counterpart, a modern Turkish word that directly corresponds to it. So this morning, a few students of mine were asking what actually altruism meant. And so it means this. It means that um, you do things. Um, let's see which one is the light here. Oh, I hope I don't press something wrong. Oops. <laughs> OK. All right, there is a light, a weak one. So altruism means uh, an individual is doing something to help another individual who is going to help even a third one to achieve what that third one is trying to do. But the first and the second uh, gain no benefit from doing this. So it means uh, doing things for the benefit of someone else the, 
and, and, and knowing that it will have no uh, direct benefit to you. So this exists in cancer research, and I'm going to give you an example as to how uh, it exists, how, how um, it happens. And I'm going to tell you that it's extremely critical because uh, it helps cure the cancer patient or it helps generate data by which we can now cure cancer patients. But it also is an aid to the isolated scientists and an isolated scientist could be any scientist in uh, anywhere from Milwaukee to Turkey, but it means a scientist who does not have access to every tool that um, a very successful scientist might have. So, um, as I said, this is not a talk for biologists, so I'll start with this. This image uh, is um, a very schematic and simplistic depiction of a cell. We are made of cells, every um, eukaryotic organism, meaning organisms that contain, uh, uh, who contain a nucleus in their cells are called eukaryotic organisms, and all eukaryotic organisms are made of cells. So a more realistic depiction of a cell would be like this, and there are several cells here with the nucleus in the middle, as you can see, and they are touching each other. So the nucleus of the cell, shown here in green is not empty as I have depicted like this, but it contains uh, DNA. And DNA is a linear, very long molecule. It's about three meters in length. That's how we teach the students. And it consists of several independent molecules which are called chromosomes. But uh, basically it looks something like this. It's a big mesh of linear, very thin molecules in the nucleus. Um, <coughs> Now, if you could look at that mesh cl closely, you would realize, and this is a sort of a fictional um, um, um, magnificate, magnification or a magnified uh, scale of a very short region within the genome, you can find individual regions on the DNA which are called genes. So here we are looking at four of them. And in our genome, in every cell, we have about 20,000 of these. So the reason why we have genes is because they make proteins. So every gene makes a different protein. Their shapes are different and their functions are different. And in fact, you see these proteins when you look at different tissues. When you buy liver from the supermarket, it looks different from meat, which is muscle, because meat and liver tissue Although they have the same cells in terms of the DNA, they make different proteins. So when you are looking at liver, you see the liver protein. When you are looking at muscle, you see the muscle protein. When you are looking at me, you see the skin proteins on the surface of my uh, whatever face. And that's <clears throat> that actually indicates that every tissue is, is turning on different genes. So some tissues uh, activate a gene which makes the skin protein, the other tissue activates the gene which makes the brain protein. So here I'm trying to give an example to what I mean. For example, if we had only these four genes we would, we are, we would be focusing on, let's say normal skin would be producing a protein from gene A and gene C, but not from B and D, but brain would be producing proteins from B and C. That means the tissues know which genes to turn on and which genes to turn off. In fact, that's the reason why they are different. They make different proteins because they turn some genes on and turn others off. Now, if you would look at skin cancer and look at the genes which it turns on and off, you will be able to see differences between normal skin and skin cancer. For example, in this case, the hypothetical gene C is upregulated, meaning that it's turned on to a much greater extent than it ought to be in skin cancer. And in brain cancer, we have these two other genes which are turned on or overexpressed. So therefore, if you have the means to study whether a gene is turned off or on, you can understand the biology of um, the mechanism behind why tissues look different, 
but you might also be able to understand why a tissue becomes cancer or why it is um, not cancer and why it is normal. Um, when I uh, started graduate school in 1988, I decided to um, go into a laboratory for a rotation. And I chose the laboratory because the person in the laboratory who was running the laboratory had published a paper a few years ago in Nature. And Nature is possibly the best or the second best pay, um, scientific uh, publication in, in biology. And if you publish a paper in Nature, that means you are really very, very good. So the uh, title of the paper is a bit difficult to understand maybe, but what she did, and this was the person here, what she had done was to identify, characterize just one of those genes that we have 20,000 of. Characterizing just one gene, defining the sequence of it, and identifying where it is in the genome, where exactly among that DNA it is located, was a very big deal at that time. And to be able to do this successfully, deserved a nature paper. So, um, things have changed dramatically since then, and we are in a new age. Uh, because identifying genes and their sequences and where they are located in the genome was so important, there was a huge undertaking led by the um, Americans and supported by the Europeans which lasted for about 13 years and cost about $2.7 billion. And it required the full-time work by 6,000 scientists. This, was, this project was called the Human Genome Project. And the idea was to characterize all genes in our genome. At the end of this process, so this, this is the year I um, started my, uh, the, finished my rotation when the Human Genome Project started. And obviously, 2003 is pretty recent. So um, at the end of this project, it was understood that in every cell of our body, we have the same 20,000 genes, about 20,000, 20 plus thousand. And as I just told you, some of these are turned on, some of them are turned off. So the types of experiments we did in the laboratory in 1990s was to test if a gene is active in a tissue or not. We would look at just one gene and try to understand whether it's turned on in a given tissue or a cancer type or not. In 2001, however, close to the end of the Human Genome Project, there was technology out there already whereby we could evaluate all 20,000 genes in one shot. This is a dramatically different technology, obviously, compared to what existed 10 years ago. Because if we had this technology in 1990, we wouldn't be doing these experiments. We wouldn't be bothering to look at just one gene. We would start with this technology, where we could look at all 20,000 genes together in the same experiment. So this new technology is uh, simplistically called microarray technology. And I'm not going to explain what the technology is, but uh, suffice to say that it is technology by which you can determine whether a gene is on or off for a given tissue. And you can uh, test uh, um, at the same time the presence of um, the activity of all 20,000 genes. So um, let's do a microarray experiment in the laboratory. So I want to do a microarray experiment. I said I wouldn't have done those one gene experiments. I would have done the microarray experiment. Um, so these are the things I would have to do. I would have to prepare so-called RNA from tissues. And I would have to prepare this RNA so that it, it is microarray ready, so a bunch of treatments there. And then I would perform the actual microarray experiment. All of this, including some mistakes and repeats, etc., would cost about $1,000. Now, um, if I have about 200 tissues in my hand, which are slightly different, and I want to compare their gene um, expression status, 
then, of course, the costs go up to 200,000 because I would have to do this for each tissue. Now, the people who are going to do this will require a salary. So let's say this is the salary that I would have to pay uh, a technician plus maybe two doctoral students. And I would have to buy equipment which can perform these experiments. So altogether, uh, you know, a hypothetical estimate would be about half a million dollars to do this type of an experiment. Now, who gives me this money and how can I get it? The way we as scientists get money is, this, is based on this scheme. Here is the person who has the authority to give me money and he is generally paid, or she, by the government. It's a government official. Basically, the money that I use for my research comes from government, from taxes. This is the case in Turkey, as well as in the States, as well as in Europe, etc. So the um, the money, the tax money, goes to the funding organization. In Turkey, this is called TÜBİTAK. In the United States, it's called NIH and so forth. And there are several others, but these are the primary ones. So this is me, and this is my graduate student. And I say, look, I have a very good idea. I want to compare 200 uh, tissues, and I want to do microarray experiments. And the reason I want to do is this and the way I'm going to do it is that, and I expect these results to come out. So that's written in this proposal here. So I send my proposal to the grant officer. The grant officer doesn't understand anything from science. Well, they do, but they don't, might not know much about my proposal. So they find people in the scientific community who do understand what I will be doing, and they give my proposal to them. Those individuals evaluate my proposal, and they come with uh, a conclusion. They are anonymous to me. I don't know them. I don't know them because if they reject my proposal, I'd be very angry, and the anonymity obviously uh, saves their lives here. But if they uh, think that the project is worthwhile of funding, they tell the grant officer to do exactly that, and the grant officer in Turkey will um, support my grant with, um, uh, via a typical mechanism, grant mechanism. And in Turkey, the typical grant mechanism will pay me about 360,000 liras for three years. But I just told you that a single large microarray experiment would cost about half a million dollars. So that means in Turkey, using the regular grants that are available for these purposes, it's pretty unlikely that I'll be doing a large-scale experiment. You can say you can downscale the experiment, which is most of the time what we do. But the experiment that I mentioned to you would be impossible to do. So, um, let's say um, I did get a grant for a project, and there are two types of experiments that I could get a grant for. One is a small-scale experiment like this one, I have 16 samples, and I have only two genes, and therefore it ends up giving me 20 data points, and I end up with a figure shown here where you have 20 data points. So each, each um, the battery here I think is dying, but each one of these is a data point, and so you have 16 there and 16 here. And this can be published in a scientific journal. But if I actually can get the money and um, do a microarray experiment, which I just told you about, I would publish my results because I would do my analysis that um, are, would be based on my microarray experiment results. But look at this. I did the microarray experiment with 200 samples, and for each sample it gives me information about 20,000 genes. So at the end I have 4 million data points. So depending on which type of uh, question you're asking, there is a lot of data here. And obviously I had a project, so I had a particular question that I was want, willing to answer. And with that microarray experiment, I'm going to answer that particular question. But there are many, many more questions you can ask based on this particular data that I have generated. So at that stage, I will put my data into a database so that it can be further analyzed by others, by other scientists. So this database is web-based, 
and it's either called Geo or Array Express, to my knowledge, and both of these are public. So once I put my data there, any one of you can go in there and look at my data, download it, and do your own analysis with it. In fact, there is no country limitation here. If the person who did the microarray experiment is in Turkey, anyone in any other country can download this and do their analysis. Now, um, I wish I was on the left-hand side, but generally I'm on the right-hand side. And uh, those who put their uh, microarray experiments into databases are obviously in countries which are richer and therefore can afford spending more money on this type of research. But they don't mind sharing their data with me. So this is the point which I'm trying to emphasize. Um, so if you go into one of these databases, GEO for example, and I just did this yesterday for the sake of this talk, and I typed in cancer. It says there are 180,205 samples there of whose microarray data exists in the database. If each sample cost only $500 to generate the data, this would amount to 74 million hundred and something thousand dollars worth of experiments which you can then tap into and do your experiments with if you know how to do it. Now, this is the skill. The data is there. So if it is so easy to understand this data, then, you know, why not do all the experiments yourself as you are generating the microarray data and publish them? It's simply too much. You will not have enough time to do all the analysis and all the experiments related to even your own microarray data. So therefore, people are very willing to put this on the web so that others can do it. And that's where the altruistic part comes into play. So therefore, we are now in Turkey able to download this data and ask um, questions to which the answers could be extremely critical. Sorry. I think the battery is wearing out on this. So before I continue on with what we do with, these, um, with this data, I want to explain to you how the data looks like a little bit so that you don't get too confused. But um, it's not meant to make the situation complex. I'm going to do this very simply, so hold your horses. So this is uh, a small um, a window of data, uh, of microarray data, as it would actually look like. So here we have genes, and we have 20,000 of them. I'm just showing you a few. And for each of the genes, we have data coming from microarray experiments related to a given patient. This is a patient. So patient number one had this gene active at a a numeric value here at this value and another gene uh, gave this numeric value obviously the first gene was more active than the second gene so the first gene was turned on to a higher extent than the second gene and therefore the number here is higher so the second patient here has somewhat of a different profile the first gene is also um, on but the onness, the rate at which it is utilized in uh, the patients, this is a patient tumor sample, in the tumors of that patient is somewhat lower compared to the tumor tissue of the first patient. And this way we have about, in this microarray data, 200 patients. So for 200 patients, cancer patients, we know um, the rate at which a given gene is turned on or off. But the important thing is, we not only know this, but we know um, the clinical data of the patients. So here, in this line, you can see how long these patients survived. This is from a cancer um, patient database, and the cancers were pretty grave. So as you can see, this patient survived 194 days after diagnosis, but this one here lived only 21 days. So, why did this patient here live 21 days when this one lived 194? What's the difference between them? 
The difference between them lies somewhere here. And where is that difference? How can we know? So that requires a particular analysis of the data. And the creativity and skill in understanding microarray data comes from the way you basically analyze it. There are endless ways of doing this. And so if I did it, the data that I would come up with might be somewhat different from somebody else's data, but eventually when we all combine our output, we will finally find which genes are critical in uh, extending the lifespan of a given patient type and which genes, when turned on or off, are critical in, um, in shortening lifespan. So, um, So uh, this is the way we do it in the laboratory. The, um, we analyze the data, uh, and primarily this data here shown is, uh, was generated by Murat, who is sitting right here somewhere, and uh, Mitat Gönen, who is our collaborator, statistician collaborator at Sloan Kettering, because you ju don't want to do these analysis just you know, based on common sense. You need some, obviously, professional support as to how best they should be done. But um, in collaboration with Mitat, we um, plotted the um, patients uh, that I showed you in the earlier um, um, slide. Um, here are the numbers. So there are about um, 100 and uh, I think, I'm not sure how many patients there are, but I think there are 270 patients here. And the longest uh, surviving patient survived for 140 plus months, and the shortest survival was around, uh, as you can see, zero months. It died in a few days. And the, this, therefore, shows the overall survival time of these patients. And on the x-axis, you can see the expression, the um, activity of a given gene, a single gene, and the gene is called ULBP2. So, if you look at the graphic overall, you will see that there is a tendency for those patients who have lower levels of the gene to live longer, and as the gene is uh, turned on, survival decreases. So this can be identified statistically, and in fact, this was identified statistically. What we did next uh, with Mitat and Murat was to define a particular cutoff value where the two groups of patients could be identified or distinguished the best. Meaning, if we set a given number, those patients with gene expression intensities below and above that number should give us the biggest difference. And indeed, if you do that, you will see that the two groups of patients behave very differently. Um, the patients who have um, gene expression values lower than that value are surviving better than those who have higher values. And this graphic simply shows you what happens to these two groups of patients after the time of diagnosis, which is right here. As you uh, keep following these over a period of time, you see that one patient has died here, and then another, and then another, and so forth, and so forth. So at the end of 140 months, 80% of the patients in the top group um, are surviving. Whereas on the bottom group, only 30% are surviving around uh, this time point. And if you continue on, very few uh, do. So this gene by itself can distinguish whether a patient is going to survive long or will not survive very long, even and therefore, you can do this when a patient comes to you for the first time. He will say, okay, I've been diagnosed with cancer. Am I going to survive long or short? Um, and why is that important? So I'm going to give you an answer to that, which is very important. And I think we have a good answer. But before I say that, I want to emphasize what this one here is. Um, in biology, if you use a given technology to determine a result, that is never enough. That strongly suggests that something is that way. You have to do the same experiment with a totally different technology to validate the results of those that you identified with the first. 
So this is basically a validation experiment of this one. Here there are 270 plus patients, here there are only 100 patients. But these 100 patients were typed for the same gene using a different technology and using that different technology we could still distinguish two groups whose survival differed albeit not as, uh, as dramatically here but it still did differ so this and the number and the time we had followed these patients is much shorter here it's about 30 months so if this had been extended to 140 and if we increase the number of patients this graph probably would look better. But I'm convinced that this is a validation of the earlier results. All right, so let's say we did validate this and we are pretty sure that this gene is determining the outcome of patients in cancer. What can we do? So um, one thing you can do is to look up the literature and see what people have done with that gene before you, did any, you are going to do anything with it. So, uh, and by the way, I'm not acknowledging all the people uh, one by one in these slides. I'll do that at the very end, but you can see who did these, uh, these analysis and these experiments. So this is something very similar to what I showed you before, but here we are looking at two different genes, not just one. So here, these patients who are doing very well um, have both these genes turned on. These patients have both of them turned off and these patients, patients have one turned on and one off. And as you can see again, there's a very dramatic difference. If a patient comes to you and says, what is my survival going to be? You can tell them that if they don't have these two genes transcribed, if they're not on, the survival is going to look grim. Good, so then next, what? If the survival looks grim. So uh, Karam did this analysis here, and he realized that these two genes, this is called a pathway analysis, and we try to link all types of data existing in literature in one um, figure. He realized that there was a particular drug whose activity correlated with the um, intensity of the activity of these genes. And the papers that were published uh, that on which this analysis was based indicated that if patients did not produce these two genes, in other words, this group here, they would be sensitive to this drug. This is a drug here, Iressa. So um, we wanted to test that in the laboratory ourselves to see if that was indeed the case. And on the bottom, what you can see here is the sensitivity of the cells we tested in the laboratory to this given drug in relation to the intensity of the gene expression. So as you can see, as you have more expression, the cells are less sensitive, and as they have, as they, when they have lower expression, they are more sensitive, that's what it means. So we could corroborate this data, this data. we could validate it in the laboratory, and although we have here very few dots, that still indicates that we are on the correct uh, direction. And here another one. So why is this important? This is important because now if we for sure can tell that patients will not survive for a long time when they arrive in the clinic, we can suggest that they uh, be treated with ERESA, which is not part of a regular treatment regimen for these patients. So we are suggesting that they rather be treated via a method which currently is not utilized to treat these patients, and therefore it's very important data. Now, um, this is the last piece of data I want to show you, and uh, in my opinion it reflects uh, what else can be done with microarray data, which is extremely important. So this data comes from a microarray um, analysis, uh, similar to what I showed you before, but the Microarray data, the gene expression data, is not related to patient survival. It's related to the sensitivity of individual samples to given drugs. And many drugs were tested. Now, one of the drugs that was tested is called dasatinib here. And dasatinib is a cancer drug. But which cancers is dasatinib going to target the best? Who should be treated with dasatinib? This question can be answered using the microarray data as well. So the graphic that was generated here 
has only reds and blacks because of the particular way we analyze the data. We generated a cutoff value for each gene, and based on that cutoff value, the sample was either positive or negative, and in this case, it's a positive. For this gene, in this case, it's a negative. And then uh, my students were able to classify the individual cells, the tumor cells, from the uh, most sensitive to the most resistant based on the genes that they expressed. So this part predicted whether the cells were sensitive or resistant to docetinib. Now, if they had done a perfect job, no flaw, well, I mean, they did a perfect job, but if the data, if this analysis worked perfectly, then we would start here with a very bright yellow, and it would turn purple this way, and we, had, we would have purple all the way down here, and just purple. But the fact that most of the purples uh, congregate on the left and the yellows on the right still means that we are doing a pretty good job of separating those cells which are sensitive and resistant to dacetinib just by looking at which genes they are expressing. Um, this is important because if a patient comes to you and says, OK, uh, I can't use Iressa, the drug that I showed you before, but I want to use something else, or is there another drug with less side effects, or is there another drug which is going to treat my cancer better? Then we can do this type of an ana ana analysis and tell him whether, or her, whether the tumor will be sensitive to this particular drug or not. Um, what my students did was also another interesting thing. They classified the cells based on which tissue they originate from uh, on the bottom lane here. And as you can see, you have, maybe you can't read this very well, but this is lung cancer, this is a neu a neural cancer, a sarcoma, so, a mixed um, so connective tissue cancer, breast cancer, etc., etc. So, as you can see, the reds are all here. And the reds are blood-derived cancers, so leukemias, for example. And the fact that they are all on this side means that they are going to be relatively resistant to desatinib. So it suggests that the type of cancer that originates from the blood cells should not be treated with desatinib. But what is here? For example, they tell me that renal cell carcinoma is extremely sensitive because it's more or less in this region, to this particular drug. So that, that profiling is also important because you can distinguish particular types of tumors that would be sensitive to particular types of uh, drugs. And with that, I'd like to conclude the talk and take questions, but I'll have to acknowledge those people who did the work. The um, first three students there, Kerem, Murat, and Zeynep, all of them are here are graduate students in the laboratory. Mehdi is the postdoc who did the cytotoxicity work, and Emre is the postdoc before him who did the ULBP work. Sechil is currently a graduate student, but together with Ezgi, they were actually undergrads who worked on the ULBP project. Özlen is also here. She is our major support in the bioinformatic approaches and guide, guides us as to um, what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. And um, Chidam and her student Akif at uh, the computer science department were um, helpful in um, helping us generate an algorithm by which we did the drug gene expression correlations. Mitat, I mentioned already, is our statistician. Mikal is a clinician from uh, Israel who provided um, melanoma data for us and also tissues. Both uh, Ismail Gömçel and Mesut Tez are clinicians, and they are collaborators, um, therefore, in the colorectal cancer um, um, part of the story. And these are the organizations that supported the uh, research. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ali for what was, for me, a very clear and understandable presentation Thanks. of a subject which obviously is very specialized and difficult. And I did recognize the cell on the first. <laughs> <laughs> Points for me there. So thank you again. Now we sure, have uh, just under 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, I'm sure there are uh, questions of various sorts for here. Anyone wish to start us off? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
questions. So the biologists all feel that this was too simple for them, obviously, so no questions to be asked. You can ask slightly more complicated questions well, that's right. if you wish, I'm sure. That's okay. Well, I have a question. It's always the job of the chairman to start things off. That's up. right. Um, and this probably is a very silly question, but um, with the data where you were looking at um, the length of survival for the patients, you said that starting from diagnosis. Now, again, this is where I'm being ignorant, but possibly people are diagnosed at different times during the illness. Is that something it's possible to take? Can you judge the age of the cancerous growth, whatever it is, uh, according to some uh, evidence? And then you, because if I'm diagnosed five weeks after you, then in theory I'm going to pass away sooner. Is that, I mean, is that a relevant question? Is that uh, absolutely, of course. That's called a confounding factor professionally, and it means it will confound your analysis unless you take that into account. So that would be called stage, for example, and if you are at a later stage at the disease versus someone who has been diagnosed at an earlier stage, and if you don't take that into account in your analysis, your genes might simply be finding the state of the stage of the cancer for you. So unless you take that into account. Or there are other confounding factors, for example, smoking is one, or there might be other risk factors, sometimes gender is one, and there are a bunch of others. So the more of these you consider, obviously, the finer an analysis you will, uh, you will have. All right, so the question... What about the private labs, Craig Venter? Do they participate in this giving away? Mm, all right, so, so the two questions are, uh, the, the, all this data being large and available, does anybody charge anything? The answer to the first question is no, they don't. The only thing they would want you to do is to acknowledge their work. So they have obviously um, paid a huge lot of um, money to, to actually get the data out there. So you would just, um, and they have generally a paper published somewhere that uh, explains how this data was generated. If you publish based on your own analysis, they would expect you to acknowledge them by simply citing their paper in your paper. That would be all. Now there, I'm not sure if uh, Craig Venter, uh, yeah, of course he, he is the human genome, the other human genome person. But I'm not sure whether he has a microarray data, which is private. Um, but if to answer the question uh, as to whether individuals who, who might not want to um, make their microarray data public, wh whether they would want to charge uh, a fee for sharing their data with you, that's the second question, um, I believe that would be ethically incorrect. So, so far, um, those individuals who have not made their data public, and there are quite a number of them, will send their data to you if you simply ask them. You just send them an email, you say, I understand from this particular paper of yours that you have published this type of a data, and would you please share that with us? So we did that once, and they sent us our da their data. But we realized that the data was not very reliable. So the one reason uh, to use public databases is because it, it carries accountability with it. And if you make your data public and people analyze your data and they see flaws, then, then the data is not of great quality and can't be used much. So we don't push people for their data too much. And given the fact there's, that there's so much out there already, uh, you can easily get by doing whatever you are interested in. Uh, I'm sorry? Patenting. Um, what about patenting? So that's, of course, a, a sensitive issue. And um, there's a general rule that says human genes can't be patented. And uh, everybody abides with this. However, the utilization of human um, gene-related products for given purposes, for example, to diagnose uh, cancer at an earlier stage, or to distinguish between early and late stage of cancer. If you come up with a particular type of assay, which can be sold to a company, and therefore the company would have to make that assay and sell it to hospitals, then 
um, the company would want you to patent it because otherwise any company will produce it and they will have no competitive advantage over each other. And companies, I mean, that's the way things work today, will not produce uh, something if they can't earn anything from it. But this type of data is, is obviously uh, not patented. Some? There is some altruism. Well, yes, correct. Among the scientists, there is complete altruism. Yeah. A little right. bit less amongst the commercial. Uh, okay. uh, in terms of the religious debate, there is a lot of I'm just thinking about the generalizability of data, that type of data. Whenever you pick the data, that, that data says present a specific target audience. I know. How, whether the first question, can we generalize that data based on these findings? Because there are certain behavioral and other biological processes involved in that specific sort of data. So there's, in that type of analysis, I believe when you do the meta-analysis or synthesis of the data, there are some issues, how can you generalize and put in further, uh, put into incorporated for further research? So that was a little concern for me whenever we do that type of analysis. How can we curtail or how can we minimize those biases in that data set. So you said that was the first question. Do you have a second? Yes. OK, the first question is, I'll repeat it so that everybody can hear, is can, can, extra questions. So, uh, yeah, OK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so the question is, can you trust the data that you have generated upon the analysis of this type of um, approach? Now, um, I've showed you data that came from one so-called data set, that means, let's say, 270 patients for a given cancer type. Now, if you want to uh, be sure, or, you know, you can't be sure, but if you, want to be, if you want to be able to trust your data a bit more, you would find another data set, another cancer group of the same type of patients, another number. Do the same analysis. See if you find the same genes that do exactly the same thing. Let's see you found a third, a fourth, a fifth, and all of these are giving you more or less the same gene as, as the culprits of identifying, uh, that are helpful in identifying uh, whatever you are trying to identify. Then, then you have a pretty solid hold of it. But I showed you a little bit of a data where we said we, we are validating this using our own technology and different assays. And you need to do that nevertheless, even if you have a lot of data sets that all show you the same thing, you would have to do your validation experiments. And ultimately, that won't be enough either. Many people will do their own validation experiments, and when we have quite a number of validation experiments published, will the companies be interested in utilizing those genes as part of uh, diagnostic or other types of technologies? There was a question at the back. I could. You know, how fast are we going to be able to treat cancer? Uh, the way we would like to treat cancer is the question, I understand. I see. Okay, so the... the, the, the, the, the all right, so when do we eradicate, eradicate cancer? That question, you know, I don't know. Uh, but when, when can we treat patients better than what we do currently, that I think is going to happen very, very soon. And I think we have to do these analyses very fast because a lot of people are doing them. And uh, we will all publish our data. And as I just explained a minute ago, uh, when we have a lot of data published, eventually it will be clear that uh, a given drug, which is not used currently for a given population, is perfectly suitable for that population and that we should uh, go for it. So okay. let's thank uh, Dr. Gura again for uh, a very Thank you. And something which I'm very happy to hear so much altruism in a very important field. Well. Exactly, again, exactly. It's a story people tend to guard their information. That's right, from others, that's so right. It's a case where it's both good but productive. As well.
Uh, I would like to thank the members of the library staff who always helped to arrange exactly, the talks. Exactly, of they course. Very hard. Uh, and invite you all to our third and final library lunchtime lecture for this semester, which will take place on Monday, not Wednesday, Monday, the 10th of December. And Elif Denizci, who is a new member of the Tourism and Hotel Management Department, will be arranging something. We're hoping it'll be more than just a talk. We may even bring some food along or something <laughs> like that. But I'm going to meet her hopefully next week and we make the arrangements for that. Keep an eye on the emails and Facebook. Thank you again. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Sorry to rush at the end. As I said, no, no, of you course, see the cleaners waiting to come That's in. That's right. No problem. No problem.